Hello everyone and welcome to my Lilac 2014 talk, Playing with Information Literacy. My name is Andrew Walsh, I'm an academic librarian and teaching fellow at the University of Huddersfield in Yorkshire in the north of England. Most sensible way of getting hold of me is via Twitter, Andy Walsh 999. So what am I going to talk to you about in terms of playing with information literacy? I'm going to cover definitions of what I mean by play. So what is play? What I mean by games. So what are games? And a little bit about what gamification is as well. So things like the sort of the Lemon Tree project that I've talked about uh, lots of places before. And then go on to cover some games that we could produce. Uh, so examples of quick and not so quick games and play activities. Uh, how to how we might be able to prototype some games, some materials that we might be able to use for that, and some places we might be able to go to to actually produce finished games. So we crack on to my first of my definitions, first of my ideas here, which is what is play? There's a lot, lot of definitions around for all these things, but one of the definitions that I really like for play just lists a series of attributes so it gives you an, a really clear idea of what it might be. Play, first of all, is apparently purposeless. So, you know, it's quite hard to see the reason for play when you go into it. It's very much done for its own sake. Play has to be voluntary. You can't force people to play, although you, you can put people in situations where they're allowed to play. You can't really force it. Uh, play has inherent attraction. So people tend to want to play. A couple of really important things here. When you're playing, you tend, there tends to be a freedom from time and a diminished consciousness of self. Uh, and I tend to think that's tied with uh, what a lot of people will talk about about as a magic circle. So you step within the magic circle of your play area and you have a certain element of sort of freedom from normal time and an ability to role play more. So dim diminished consciousness of what you're actually doing as your own person. You're allowed to do different things when you're playing. Uh, so this idea of the magic circle I tend to use the example of sort of when I was playing at sort of, I don't know, seven, eight years old, running around uh, the estate I grew up on, there was a certain area where we'd play cowboys and Indians or soldiers. So we knew that once we stepped over a particular place, uh, we were within that magic circle. So as long as we were didn't go past the garages on one side and a certain patch of grass on another side and and the fence on the other side etc we knew we were in that magic circle although of course we didn't use that as a term term <clears throat> and while we were there we were completely in the game we weren't ourselves we were our game characters uh moving on so sort of play has improvisational potential so although there tends to be rules the rules are what we agree when we go into the game and we can change them as we're playing so we can tweak things as we're going when we're playing we're not uh, firmly controlled by the structures placed upon us by the game and last of all uh, play has definite continuation desire as well as sort of that initial inherent attraction we want to play we want to carry on playing as well And this definition was from Brown and Vaughan, play, how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination and invigorates the soul. So if that's play, what are games? Games are awful to try and define. Uh, so I've, I've picked one here that gives a fairly straightforward 
point of view of what games are and uses the same sort of attributes of ensuring the play definition. And it just talks about the four key attributes that, uh, that all games have. So according to this definition, all games have a goal. So we know what we're aiming towards. They have rules that tell us how we get towards that goal. They have a feedback system. So we know how we're progressing. We know if we're winning or losing or how far around the game we are. And again, tying back to, uh, to that play definition, they have to have voluntary participation. It's really hard to force people to play a game. You just put them into a situation where you encourage it, you can't force it. And that definition is from uh, Jane McGonagall's book. You may, you know, the, the, there are much more academic definitions than that. But there's also much looser definitions. So you might just think of games as being more, it's sort of play with more formal rules laid on top. So that's playing games. And then we've got this weird idea here of gamification. Uh, gamification, the example uh, I use is Lemon Tree, which we use at the University of Huddersfield. Uh, it's not strictly a game, it has game-like elements, it has playful elements, uh, and that's because it's a gamification project. It uses those sort of typical elements we might find in game playing, like competing with others, leaderboards, getting points, having set ways of getting those points, uh, seeing our progression, and it applies it to a different area, so it applies it to the library and borrowing books and issuing books, which we might not expect to be a game. So it's not fully a game, it's a gamification project. Uh, and there's gamification cropping up all over the place using these sort of elements. Uh, and this definition, by the way, is from the Oxford English Dictionary. So that's an idea of what play games and gamification are. but what are these things good for? In particular, play and games more than gamification. The first area I'd say they're good for is playfulness. Oh, by the way, these three areas I've pinched from Nicola Whitton at uh, Manchester Met University, uh, who's uh, sort of an important games researcher and educationalist. And... Uh, and she sort of tried to look at the different areas of games and one of the things she did. So one area they're good for is playfulness in creativity. So it allows us to think about and to do things we might not otherwise have been willing to do. And that's related to sort of stepping inside that magic circle where we have a diminished consciousness of self and uh, sort of reduced awareness of time as well. So when we're playing, we can do things and create things and think about things that we might be reluctant to do if we're not within that game and within that playful environment. Something that comes up a lot around games is about engagement. And games can definitely be engaging. Uh, it's one sort of core area people might want to use games for, but there are risks there. People often think, I've got a game, people will want to play it. People will flock to my library website to play this awful involved library game. Of course they won't. Uh, games are not always engaging, and they might be engaging for some groups and not for others. So it's one area we might use games for, but don't make the mistake of thinking it's the be-all and the end-all. And you can, actually, you can have games that are deliberately not engaging as well, deliberately annoying and frustrating, but, which might bring us on to the last item, but they, they're good for learning. So, I mean, there's even a, a, a whole sector of games-based learning called serious games. Uh, so games don't need to be fun and engaging. They just often are. Uh, 
what they're really good for, games, in terms of information literacy, is this third area that I've just touched on here of active learning and that idea that people can step inside this game environment and use that that time of play to construct their own knowledge. So switching the idea from me standing at the front and saying, these are the facts, they should sink into your head and that, you know, that's the lot, you've done your learning, to games as an opportunity for people to discover facts and turn that into the knowledge through the game and through discussion afterwards. So three areas, playfulness, engagement, active learning. You can have games that address one of them. You can have games that address all of them. So <clears throat> you could have, you may well want to do a game that's about active learning. It's about people constructing their own knowledge in a session that you do, that you deliberately try to make as engaging as possible. You know, that, that's a, a very sensible combination. Uh, you might want <coughs> to try and overlap all three. And that's where, the sort of, again, the serious game researchers might say alternate reality games would step in. So if you can get playfulness and that sort of exploration type idea going in, you get engaging, you can get active learning going on. That's the sort of thing that games researchers will be aiming for out of an alternate reality game, which is sort of mixing reality and games together. <clears throat> so that's what playing games are. That's what they might be good for. What about some examples of these sort of things? I'll just come up with a few quick games here that, that we've done at Huddersfield. Uh, first of all, one I did a couple of years ago, <coughs> which is called Seek, and that's a game about uh, constructing a search strategy, essentially. So people will play in groups of five or six, a card game for five or six minutes that introduces lots of ideas around constructing a search strategy. Some of the some of the questions and answers are deliberately slightly loose, uh, slightly open to interpretation, and the idea would be that people spend that five or ten minutes being introduced to those ideas, sometimes challenged slightly by the ideas, and have the chance to argue about whether they agree with them or not, and then we'd follow it up by a five or ten minute discussion as well. About the sort of things that have come up and how they might apply it and what they agree with and what they don't agree with uh, which is where the in-depth learning happens so we introduce lots of ideas through the game give people the opportunity opportunity to think about them and then the discussion afterwards they reflect on those ideas <coughs> and we make that learning sort of one step deeper Another really simple little game is using the top trumps type idea. So here we've got top resources. So a set of cards where we might sort of set off different types of resources against each other. People could play those, <coughs> play a game in a small group. Doesn't matter who wins, but it's getting across the idea that there's lots of different types of resources whether we put our names of databases here or things like, in this example, a conference paper, journal article, book, encyclopedia, etc. And our quick go of what sort of points might be worth for those sort of things. And that introduces the range of resources to people. And again, the deeper learning happens afterwards in a discussion where we can then challenge people to say, well, have you come across this type of resource before? What do you think of it? Do you agree with the sort of relative points we've put on there? Uh, can you go off now on a hands-on bit and, and find those resources and see if you agree or not? Uh, or even give people blank cards and have them go off and investigate resources and 
fill in the details themselves afterwards. So the game itself is the start of more in-depth learning around it. I often, often do card type games because they're easy to use and I have a, a few different ones that I'm referencing. So I've got one that, uh, that I haven't started using yet but I'm just finishing off. Uh, in fact all these referencing ones I'm just finishing off. So this one is a set of cards that will have examples of a layout and then challenge people to actually construct their references based on that sort of crib sheet if you like. I've done a set of mini cards, some big sets of mini cards that people can use in groups based on what I did on slips of paper this year. So this is almost a tarted up version of a game that I've already done. Uh, so people can take different elements from these referencing cards and make them up into full references. So they can try to make sense of how a reference is put together uh, without having to worry about the scary you know, bits of punctuation and whatnot because a lot of that's already laid out. Uh, so they'll earn more points for the more challenging ones and less points for the easy ones and they can try and see how many they can do in a set time period. And after that, I tend to ask them, when I've, when I've done it with me, me slips of paper, can people see the patterns that we're getting at towards these referencing? And when I've done it before, people have naturally quite scared of referencing. Uh, we tend to get quite sensibly, oh yeah, well, we've always got the author at the top, the front, and we always follow with the date, and then we've... You know, they're pulling out those sort of key elements that will hopefully make it easier for them to construct their own references afterwards. And another silly little referencing game, which is just a sort of pairs type memory game. So we'll have a reference paired up with uh, the type of reference it is there. So, so something we've taped off the TV, for that example. So people would have to turn over pairs on the table to try and match up the reference with the type of reference it is. All very quick and easy game, and the learning often happens in the discussion afterwards. <clears throat> also do lots of little playful activities. So here's one I've, I've just done but not used yet, which is making up essentially a giant dice. So a cheap cardboard that we cut and fold into a cube around the CRAP, C-R-A-A-P, way of evaluating resources. So we'll have people sat down with a particular resource that we want to uh, evaluate in a group and they'll roll this dice and decide whether to talk about currency or relevance or accuracy or authority or purpose. So they'll talk about those different elements and try to assess the resource based on those. So rather than having to pick one, it's just introducing a small playful element into it. But I also sometimes use things like Lego and Play-Doh to introduce playful activities as well. So people might make a model of something that they can then talk about. And in playing, they can do a certain amount of thinking with their hands, but they're also stepped into that magic circle of play. So they can talk about the object they've done rather than talking about the ideas they're trying to generate themselves. So it's safe for people to express ideas and challenges that they've got. Uh, that's very quick activities there. There's lots of not so quick games as well, but it's so much harder to do these sort of things. Uh, some really good examples are using alternate reality, and I've put one recent example up there. I was just published a few weeks ago. Uh, Dan Ayrton uh, in the US used a, a lost book type idea to do essentially library inductions. So people would drop through rabbit holes, drop through some entry places into the game to <coughs> start off this hunt for a lost book. 
um, in searching th- for it, nobody would necessarily know they're playing the game, even if they stood next to them, because they're partly in the game world and partly in the real world. And by the end of it, they'll have done a live induction in their own time, essentially. But there's lots of in-depth online games as well, directly dealing with information literacy skills. Uh, and this is one that was written about a lot, Bibli about. Uh, I think it's a fairly good example of them, because they often seem to have lots of money involved in setting them up, lots of time involved. People put all that time and effort and money to it. They're often quite good, but after a couple of years, the money's run out, the time's run out, they can't update them, and they start to fade away and die. <coughs> uh, although they they can be a really good idea, they're much much harder to do. So we move on quickly on so how do we make these sort of things? I would say start off with a learning objective. So have an idea of the sort of learning objectives you would normally cover in a session, or one that you want to cover in a session but maybe struggle to do so. Uh, and with that learning objective in mind. Add on top the sort of game mechanics you might pinch from other games that you know. So you saw here pinch simple things like top trumps that most people are familiar with. So take existing games and the little bits and pieces that make up those games and try to apply them to your learning objectives. Think about how I can meet those objectives using bits and pieces from other games. Uh, Mock something up as cheaply as you possibly can, whether it's slips on, of paper or I've got some resources on the handout for th- uh, things like blank cards, uh, sticky notes, blank boards, where you can fairly cheaply buy these things and mock up with sort of pens to uh, and stickers and whatever you want to use to construct a prototype game and play that with your colleagues. Play that with groups of friendly students, perhaps, and develop your basic idea of a game into a working one. Once you've got those basics going, you can then move on from that to think about how could I get something that looks nice that pe- and feels nice and people want to use. And there's several alternatives for doing that as well. Uh, People are shallow, people are going to be more engaged if you can make them professionally looking and better to touch and feel. So you could use people like the Game Crafter in the US, which will do very small volumes, one at a time if you want, of games that you've produced. Uh, There's another German company that I mentioned on my handout uh, that can print out small volumes of games as well. Uh, as well as selling lots of blanks, but for both of these companies, so lots of blanks that you can use to prototype things with as well. But there's also sort of slightly different ideas. People not involved with games at all, where you could use their products to create your own small ones of games. And I use a printer called Moo every so often uh, to print out small volumes of cards because they have the option when you're printing business cards to have a different image on the back of each card. So I'll use that different image as the front of my card, which means I can have a pack of 50 cards that are all different. So I can produce one pack at a time uh, for what, 10, 12 quid at a time. So it's quite expensive for one pack, but I can do one pack at a time instead of the tens of thousands that a game manufacturer might want to do. So that's my quick run through. So of what play games and gamification are, some quick and not so quick ways of using playing games and information literacy, and how you might actually start off doing your own. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. <laughs>